This has been a wonderful conference. And I really appreciate uh, Bob and Robin and Larry and all the others who have worked so hard to make it successful. Let's give them a hand. Now I know what most of you are actually thinking. You're thinking, how does that guy up there on the stage have the nerve to wear a coat and jacket and a dirty old baseball cap? Uh, there's two answers to that. The first one is Donald Trump. I'm just following his example. The second one, which is really the only one that counts, is my wife isn't here. <laughs> Today, I'm going to give you a peek, just a peek, at the typology of old copper culture artifacts, prehistoric American Indian copper artifacts. A wise man once said, Half of what I know isn't true. I just don't know which half. Now, I'm not that wise man. I'd say 60% of what I know isn't true. But it used to be 70%. Before that, it was 80%. So perhaps I'm gradually getting closer to the truth. Like Grandma used to say, there is a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom or knowledge is knowing that tomatoes are a fruit. Wisdom is not putting them in a fruit salad. Okay, let's have the first slide. All right, let's you and I, together with the old copper culture people, take a walk into the nearly forgotten past. Go ahead. And here we go, go ahead. What you're looking at are nearly two dozen spear points that have been typed. There are, each one is distinct and it's a distinct type with its own name, its own class, its own description. Go ahead. Uh, typology is narrowly defined, or narrowly defined typology is the study of types and a systematic classification of artifacts with common functions and characteristics into types. In a broader, more practical sense, typology is that part of taxonomy involving the taxonomic classification of whole copper artifacts, starting with kingdoms, families, kinds, division, genres, types, and varieties of types. And then we go into parts of artifacts. And the parts are made up of segments and in each segment are traits, and then we have characteristics of the traits, segments, and parts, okay? <clears throat> the projectile point division, for example, is divided into several genera. Arrowhead, atlatl heads, harpoons, spear points, darts, and so on. And today we're going to talk primarily about the spearheads. And a spearhead is a symmetrical right and left projectile point. The business end of a spear, attached to a long staff and used for hunting or war. Next. How old are American Indian copper artifacts? We think we know the age of some of the copper artifacts, but we're not nearly as sure uh, of most as we would like to be. We, uh, Dave talked yesterday about the early mining dates. I'm not going to go in that. He did an excellent job. We were all very interested. In addition to this, he had the 
uh, 92,000 years ago, we had an earlier spike. Go ahead. Uh, here we have uh, the Reardon artifacts, and I think those two points are right here. And uh, <clears throat> the interesting things about, uh, thing about this is, in addition to the date and everything, that they had a direct carbon association. In other words, it was the wood in the shafts here that they dated. So we know that that wood belonged to that artifact. It was a part of that artifact and was roughly the same date as the artifact. Not only that, they had him sent to two different laboratories and both came up with approximately the same age. So that's the, the best way of doing it. However, in many archeological digs, you don't have that luxury. In many archeological digs, you have no, nothing directly associated with the copper that you find. If you're lucky, you might have an indirect carbon association, which means perhaps at the same level, five, 10 feet away, is a fire pit with some charcoal in it. So you can date the charcoal and assume that the artifact is the same age as the charcoal. Next. <clears throat> Advancing glaciers ripped native copper from Isle Royale and the Antagonon Peninsula and pushed it or floated it uh, in front of the glacier all the way to Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio. Populations following the retreating glaciers, maybe 18,000 or so years ago, surely found copper. How long did it take them to recognize the malleability and, the, and begin manipulating it into implements and organments? A hundred years ago, a thousand, I mean, uh, did it take them a hundred years? before they decided they, to try pounding it? Did it take them, them 11,000 years? I hypothesize that we will someday find that it took them far less than what we're thinking today. I think, go ahead, next one. I think they're smart people, and I think they experiment with everything new they found in their environment. Here we have a timeline, and it's compared with the old world. Here's the time of Christ. Here is 500 BC classic Greece we studied in our history books. The pyramids 3,000 years ago. 3,500 years ago, these are BC, not years ago, BC. We had Atsi the Iceman. And then 9,000 years ago, we had uh, the cave paintings and perhaps cave men. And then uh, the, the end of the Ice Age. Now, if we look up here, we see that all of this time, American Indians were pounding copper. We, uh, Jim was talking about uh, the Agate Basin Point, and uh, it was a little older than uh, the ones that he showed so many pictures of, but he talked about this Agate Basin Point. Well, here it is in copper. I have two or three of them. Uh, when uh, uh, the Michigan archaeologist, what, what was his name? Uh, who? Holsey, John Holsey. When John Holsey uh, looked at my collection and he saw those two spear points, this one and another one, ah, agate basin copper, he said. Uh, so uh, people recognize these uh, as agate, ba agate basins. And then we have several other kinds. Okay, next. I have a qualifier that I like to make. And that is, we've provided you with a number of possible dates and we'll work with many more. But everything is based on our accepted archeological and historical paradigm being generally co correct. Uh, will our time paradigm ever change? I don't know. I assume that it's right. I base everything on it. 
but we have certainly had a lot of changes in our past. I, uh, Solomon, I think it was, who said, nothing is new under the sun. Well, scientifically, he was proven correct. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the scientific uh, principle of thermodynamics proves that no, nothing is new under the sun. However, man's conditions on earth does change and has changed significantly in my lifetime. Okay, let's go ahead. Prehistoric copper finds. It's my hypothesis. I have no real proof, but in my studying of this, I've come to conclude that these early surface finds were maybe are somewhere around 15%. And those are the ones that people found when they were following their horses in the fields, uh, or people were digging ditches or building buildings or any of the other industrialization of America. Then archaeology came into its own and it started uh, doing professional archaeological digs of uh, old copper culture cemeteries and there were a number of them. My guess is that it's less than 1% of the total copper artifacts that have been recovered to date. Detecting, that's been growing and growing faster and faster ever since the 1980s and I would suggest that it's perhaps 85% today and probably will we'll get to be far more than that. As this figure goes up, these two figures will go down. As archaeologists recover artifacts, they record the artifacts relationship to all other findings in that site and to the site in general and to other things and even sometimes to other sites and other artifacts. An archaeological record or history contains the best possible clues to deduce or prove an artifact's use and culture. <clears throat> it's very important that we have archaeological history on any ar artifact. However, we have very, very few on copper artifacts. <clears throat> And if it doesn't have an archeological history, I call it a cultural, it's actually we can leave out the name culture because it's more than culture, it's an orphan. It doesn't have anybody or anything to associate with. And since there are so few copper artifacts with archeological histories, and because I have for many, many years uh, studied artifacts and, and was hindered because of that, uh, we started building uh, diagnostic tools so that we could gain information from orphan artifacts. Go ahead. If you wish to identify a lithic projectile point, you can quickly go to Gregory Perino's three volumes, Noel Justice's three volumes, thousands of charts and references, a respected collector, most any archaeologist, but what do you do if you want to identify a piece of copper? Okay. <clears throat> More than three quarters of a century ago, 1939, when I got my first copper artifact, I began to bump, bump against the fact that few archeologists or copper collectors knew much about prehistoric American Indian copper. Oh, when as, as a child, I had a copper artifact. When archeologists came anywhere near our area, my parents would drive me to the dig and let me talk with the archeologists and show them my piece of copper. And they looked at it, nice, that's copper. Or that's a copper spear point. Uh, it's very old. How old? I don't know. What did they use it for? I don't know. Maybe a spear point. They just didn't know. 
Uh, more than a quarter of a century ago, I developed the orphan paradigm to gleam information from copper artifacts cut off from their archaeological histories. Now, I'm not competing with any archaeologists at all. They do a very good job at what they do, but we haven't had much copper uh, archaeological digs in the last 50 years. Eventually, we built a kit with many diagnostic tools to help reunite orphan copper with the cultures or ages, other information. Go ahead. Here are some of the diagnostic tools. Taxonomy, cultural tags, historical markers, which include nine categories of patination, five stages of oxidation, seven patterns of erosion, uh, creation marks, tool marks, treatment marks, metal reaction marks, decorations, uh, activity marks, break marks, use marks, wear marks, and so on. I use all of this and more and, uh, to, to try to gleam information from an artifact and to classify it. Go ahead. Typology. The use of taxon taxonomy, nomenclature, and other scientific tools that we just mentioned to classify copper artifacts. The primary taxonomic classes are kingdoms, and under that, families within the kingdoms, kinds within the families, division within the kinds, generies within the division, types uh, within the generies, and the types all have their varieties. And we have to have a name for every class, a name for every specific artifact, so we can point it out and say of uh, this artifact by name, what it is, and if anybody wants to, they can look up and find a complete description of that artifact that makes it different from all other artifacts ever created, except those that are more or less identical to it, except for the fact that each one handmade is slightly different. And for different work tasks, they have different varieties. Okay? Here we have it. Every artifact in the world falls in, into these three kingdoms, plant, animal, and mineral. You know it from childhood. And the kingdoms are made up of families. And we could have a list of dozens and dozens and dozens, perhaps hundreds of families. The one we're interested in is the copper family. We're interested in the metal kingdom, and the copper family is one of the metal kingdoms. Uh, and the, <coughs> the, the uh, copper family is made up of kinds, tool kind, ornamental kind, weapon kind, modified copper kind. Since uh, we're talking about spearheads today, and its spearheads are identified as weapon kind, even though they were used for hunting and many other things. They have to be something, we've called them weapon kind. The weapon kind has divisions, knife division, ax division, uh, 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 all division, fish hook division, whatever you want. Today, the projectile point division. The projectile point division, uh, the subtaxonic category is genry. And the genries are made up of arrowheads, dart points, atlatl points, spear points, and harpoon points, and maybe one or two others. And each of these are made up of types. We have lots of different types, and uh, this is one type, for instance, the uh, socketed triangulate. And then, once we have a type, that is a type, we know what its work tasks are, we know everything about it, we can describe it, in detail, but there are varieties. A pinhole variety, a step variety, a barb variety, and, and other varieties. And the varieties are based primarily on varieties of work tasks. Okay? 
Next, after we've got all of our uh, classes, then we take an artifact and we break it into its parts. And with a spear point, we break it into two parts, the blade part and the tang part. Now, the blade part has segments, and the tang part has segments. Here are all of the segments, maybe not all of them, but here are a bunch of segments that are blade point segments. Here are tang segments. Next. Once we have something classified, and we can say we know what we're talking about, uh, a straight back knife, for instance, and, and we can recognize that wherever we find it. Then we can go to sites that archeologists have professionally uh, excavated and where each artifact has a archeological history and we can see, at least in the Rye site, uh, what artifacts came up and what cultures they assigned them to. From that, we can tell a little bit more about our orphaned copper artifact. We can see where it falls. We can't say for sure it's that culture, but probably it is. We still don't know the location or the exact date because some of the copper artifact types apparently were made for thousands of years same type over and over and over. Uh, I'd like to uh, go over this briefly. Uh, glacial came, red ochre, and old copper culture are three overlapping middle late archaic uh, complexes. This is what Martin says. And red ochre complexes perhaps are related to the old copper culture. Rye, Oconto, and to a lesser extent, Osceola are linked to the glacial claim. Came, excuse me. And in my type, typology research tends to support the observations of Martin, uh, who most archeologists agree with. And uh, we have uh, that, here's the footnote for where that's found. Next. All right, here are some examples. These are, we call them spear points. And what do we call a spear point? A spear point is symmetrical, right to left. Now that doesn't mean it didn't have other work tasks and it doesn't mean that it wasn't used as a knife or a dagger. And I'm sure that they were from time to time. But until uh, we see evidence of their use for something else, we call them uh, spear points. This is the barb. Do you see the barb on either side? This is serrated. See the serrations? This is a turkey tail. See how much like the lithic turkey tail. This is a swallow tail. This is the ace of spades. Now let's go and look at some different kinds of ace or types of ace of spades or varieties of the ace of spade type. Go ahead. Uh, you can see the bevels on both sides. That's one of the traits. You can't see it on many of them. Maybe you can see it here or here, but that's, and we got the name uh, Ace of Spades uh, from one of the uh, uh, sites where they were discovered. Uh, go to the next slide. Here are four related old copper culture flat tang types an oval flat tang, a pinhole flat tang, a diamond flat tang, a pummel flat tang. You see the pummel on it? And this one, some of you who have collected or are your archeologist, you may have never seen one like this. And you might say to yourself, well, I doubt that that's an American Indian. That might be something else. Uh, however, we'll take a, a closer look at this type. Next slide. Here is one that, that came from the Field Museum in Chicago. Uh, here's one that uh, uh, Flasker uh, discusses and, and uh, drew a picture of. Here's one that West uh, described. Here's one that Baldwin uh, pictured in the Redskins in 1978. 
Here is one that the Smithsonian has. However, I'm a little doubtful about this one. Maybe I'll change my mind, but right now I'm on the side of thinking that this might be Luristan or something else, misidentified by the seller and also misidentified by the Smithsonian. We think sometimes that because something is a museum, well, that's it. That has the hallmark of authority and knowledge and everything else. But a lot of times museums uh, don't know as much as, as some of the archaeologists out in the field know. Or usually they don't. Uh, also, the, we talked about the old surface finds you know, made by farmers and other people. And there were old collectors who collected these and they, and they used to put them in what they called their cabinets. They are copper cabinets. And a lot of times they were uh, someone of uh, note in their community. They had little money or a lot of money. They competed each up with each other for their best copper cabinets. They wanted the biggest and the best pieces. And uh, not only did they go out and collect them themselves in the fields, but if somebody brought them to them, that was a sure money way that that person could make a little money. Uh, if he brought in a big, huge, nice piece of copper, he might get $5 for it. Uh, but they collected uh, most of the best ones. At any rate, many of those are now in the museums. That's where primarily the museum collections came from. So the museum collections sometimes have, uh, they might even have fakes, but more likely they might have foreign pieces. And that's what I'm suspecting about this Smithsonian foreign piece. And by the way, a couple of years ago, a curator of the Smithsonian Copper Collection contacted me and asked me if I would, they sent me a picture of everything they had, hundreds of pieces, and asked me if I would comment on uh, the various pieces. They said they'd like to get, they'd like to show them online. Uh, and so I made comments about a number of them and sent them to them. Okay, next. Four related rat tails. Okay, this is a long rat tail. A long rat tail is, at, the tail is at least as long and very often longer than the blade. Short rat tail. The blade is always longer than the tail. Oval rat tail. Diamond rat tail. Next. Here are some uh, very rare to common pieces. This is one of the rarest points out there, and it's a coiled tang. Anybody in this room ever see one of these? Okay, nobody. But it's a, it is, it, it's in, in a collection. I know where it is. I know who, who owns it, and, and that person has a huge collection, and he's had it for many, many years. And uh, uh, this is a, a barbed hopewell probably related to this pine tree. And uh, they are rare, but not very rare like this one. The pine tree is somewhat rare, and that's also Hopewell. They're found mostly in Michigan, but occasionally in Wisconsin, possibly other places. This is a conical, very, very common. Since that's so rare, let's take a little better look at that one. Go ahead. Here it is. Somebody sent me a picture of this one just recently, you know, in the last few months. It's practically the same thing. Do you see this odd thing here and this odd thing here? These are actual coils. They're not holes. They didn't drill a hole. They just made this smaller and smaller and smaller and tucked it up underneath. So I only know of these two. I'm sure there must be more. If anybody ever sees one, I hope you, you help me uh, uh, get in contact with the person that has it. However, here's one that we have that has this, the same traits. You see this thing here? Well, it's repeated here, just in a different place. They've taken these coils and moved them up there. And instead of having a dagger or spear point, it has a round 
point and we think that's a hairpin. It's nine and five eighths inches long. This is 11 and that's six. So this is American Indian and it is out there. Oh, we have here where these came from. This, uh, this uh, I think this is Indiana. Uh, and this is attributed to Spiral Mound. Go ahead. Okay, socketed points. There are several so kinds of or types of socketed points. This is the socketed ovate type, the socketed triangulate type, uh, conical socketed, uh, uh, or excuse me, the conical triangulate. These two are, are definitely related. And then we have the socketed bevel. See the bevel? They have sock they have bevels on both sides. This one you can see better because of the lighting. The northern, which we're gonna go to a little more detail on that. And this uh, strange and rare one, the socketed median ridge, and the pinched point. Now uh, the pinched point is always like somebody a giant coming down here and put his thumb there and finger there and sort of pinched them together. So it's in the middle of it is always pinched in the smallest part. Okay, we'll go to the details on the socketed northern. Go ahead. This is just a variety of them. It's what they look like. Uh, they're, uh, and they, we could go into the various varieties of the socketed nor northern, but the most common variety of all the socketed points are those with a step and those without a step. And let me explain that a little bit here. Those without a step, it'd be the same plane all the way down. Those with a step, we come down this far and we step down. Do you see that step? And the purpose of it is so that a spear point, excuse me, a shaft is stuck in there and it bumps up against that step. And when you throw that into something, uh, this step uh, absorbs the shock and stops the uh, shaft from jumping forward and spreading the sockets and losing the point. And you can imagine what would happen if you're facing a bear and you throw this spear at the bear and the shaft shoots up into here, these flanges spread and you lose your, your spear point all you got left is a wooden shaft, and here comes the bear, angry as angry can be. Next. This is the face median uh, ridge, and uh, you can see everyone has that face median ridge. Some have steps, some have pinholes. Uh, this one does not have a step, so there's at least two varieties. Next. Here are some early uh, copper spear point types. This is the side notch that's archaic, and this is a transitional from uh, archaic to paleo, we think possibly, we're not 100% sure. It's also probably transitional from a lancelot point to a point with a tang. This is the lancelot point. It's all blade, no tang. This is, is a, a, another uh, transitional, uh, the, du the double point. It's not really a point, it's a tang, really. And and this is the agate basin that we've talked about. This is my one of mine. And uh, it's also called the McClary point by Jack Steinbring. And this is uh, a hell ga gap type point. Ali uh, Atia uh, had that, I believe and that's what he called it. He wrote articles about it. This is a, a plain view. It looks very much like a paint plain view. Uh, someone found that near my home, about four or five miles from my home, Coopersville, Michigan, along the Grandville, uh, Gr Grand River, brought it to me. We wanted to know if it, what it, if it was copper, what it was, and so on. That's the best I could come up with. Then he sent it to Ali, and Ali came up with the same uh, analysis that I did. Next. Here is the fluted point. Now, I know some of you are taking a deep sigh there and saying, what's going on here? Well, <clears throat> that, 
that's out there somewhere. I don't know where. I know that it was sold in an auction house and uh, it sold for an awful lot of money and I don't know who bought it. And since I haven't heard anything since then, I suspect that it's probably a counterfeit. But if anybody knows, or in the future, anybody knows uh, who has this, I wish they'd put them in contact with me. I would like to see it so that I can come to a uh, better conclusion. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to go to a different type of projectile point, just briefly. <clears throat> go ahead. Oh, uh, first, there's uh, exceptions to the, I told you they're symmetrical. There are exceptions to the symmetrical spear point type. Sometimes we can see blade edges used knife-like until it's deformed. So we know that it was used as a knife, not as a spear point. Sometimes we find the remains of leather fiber are wrapped around the tang or uh, leather or fibers wrapped around the tang. Uh, as a handle, so we know that it was used as a knife. Many spear points with long blades and narrow, sharp blade tips, median ridges show obvious dagger task characteristics, work task characteristics. Arrowheads, at little points, and some har harpoon heads are also symmetrical, so they're, we know they're definitely used in, as those things, but they are not spear points, but they're symmetrical. In order to classify things, you have to have rules. So you do the same thing over and over the same way. And if you find that uh, something's not working, you have to change the rule, uh, but you have to be very careful. <clears throat> Out of 49 rules, rules 11 and 12 are abbreviated are symmetrical blades are classified as projectile points. A symmetrical uh, blades are class of unsymmetrical blades or asymmetrical blades, I mean, are classified as knives. All predictable points except harpoons are classified as spear points until evidence indicate their use as arrowheads at lateral points, etc. Okay, move along. Now, there, are, I'm, I'm not going, I'm only going to show you two or three slides here, but there are more harpoon types than there are spear point types. So many harpoon types. Believe me, they spent so much time fishing and they made so many types and varieties of types of harpoons. Now, these are uh, uh, interesting because the barb on this harpoon is at the end of the socket. That is the barb. That's an unusual barb. This was a normal spear point, but what they do, they put a chisel in here and they separated it. So this one has the barb chiseled into a normal blade, and this has a barb extended from a socket. Now, neither of those are accidents or anything like that. They're made that way. Go ahead. Uh, the barb blade harpoons. Here's a blade. Here's a blade. These are all chiseled in there. That one broke off. Uh, this And here. This is the only one that's not socketed. But that is one type of harpoon. These are, and harpoons could, in, the, in a more general way, be classified as two types. Those that are permanently fastened on a long shaft and those where the shaft is detachable as you are spearing, and they're called toggle head. Go ahead. <clears throat> now, here we have the socket. It's, it's not an accident. You may see one and think, well, there was an accident, something broke or something. But no, they made them that way. This group here are, have the barbed socket, and they all have blades. This group here are all conical or conical-like, and they have the, also the barb from the socket. Next. This is the way a uh, toggle head works. Here we have a detachable shaft that came clear back like this. We cut it off so we can get it in the picture. <coughs> With the line fastened here, and when they, you spear the fish, 
This goes inside. When they pull on the line, once inside, it's like going in a buttonhole. And you pull on the line, it turns sideways, now it can never come out. And all you have to do is pull it in. And the line harness here, I've just tried to show you different ways a line harness can be made on various types of toggle heads. But this is just a fraction of the kinds of toggle heads. There are so many toggle heads, and then there's so many fixed harpoons. It just, it's amazing the you know, number of harpoons. Uh, now I'm going to give you a little frosting on the cake and go to something else. And where's Jim? Is Jim here? Why don't you look at this? Go ahead. Here he showed you one that was about 18. Well, uh, my pike is 17.5. So his, his may be a half inch longer. It's interesting. It has this L shape. Is yours, I think yours does too, doesn't it, Jim? Yeah, I think they're, they're like twins. This is the L shape here. Now that's significant. And then this is round, starting rare, right round, 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 all the way up to here. And here it becomes square. You see this? It tells you that's if you cut it, that's what it would look like across there. If you cut that, it's square. Square, 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 all the way to the chisel. And that is a chisel on the end. This is a side view of the chisel, a face view of the chisel. Now, <clears throat> what was this used for? People have given me uh, a lot of uh, possibilities, uh, but uh, most of them, I think, don't work very well. In the wintertime, Indians had to chisel ice for two primary reasons. One is to get drinking water, and if they didn't melt the snow, but they did uh, uh, chisel holes in ice to get drinking water and to fish. Now, the last thing you want to do is have a huge thing, heavy thing like this, it weighs two pounds. What much does yours weigh, Jim? Yeah. And, and people find these things in the water sometimes or where there used to be water. And uh, if you're not careful, you know, you're chiseling hole in deep water and suddenly it comes out of the handle and you've lost it. So they decided to put this thing on it. So actually the wood, the handle would come way back here and the wood would come all the way up, all the way up, all the way up to the square part. And it would be sandwiched between the wood and there would be a groove there and that would lay, this would lay in the groove and, and the other piece would come on top and then they would uh, bind it glue it and bind it, then there's no way that that can pull out. And, and the only way they're going to lose it if it slips out of their hands. Well, this is what it looks like here. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece. I call it the Tim Ashby Pike because Tim Ashby is the one that found it. And another piece of frosting on the cake. Go ahead. This is uh, one of my most rare pieces. And this is the copper saw. It's in the Redskins volume uh, uh, 13, number 4. And the teeth are, are chiseled probably with a, uh, a stone chisel. And it appears to have been used. What's interesting is if they'd left a point on here, there's always a danger of them stabbing themselves somehow or somebody else as they're using the saw. So just like modern saws, exactly, they made it square. Eight inches long, weighs uh, three and a, and a fourth ounces, came from Marquette County, Wisconsin. And i uh, wait just a second uh, uh, before I show you the last slide. After the last slide is shown, then if any of you have any questions, I'll answer them. Go ahead. And go ahead. Okay. Any questions?